My name is Bushra Muhammad. This is the first episode of AF Turns 30, a new weekly series by the Architecture Foundation, looking back at the last 30 years of architectural history. Today, we're here to talk about Lenny D, a housing scheme completed in 2008 in Rochdam by Dutch practice Gertz and Schultz. Made up of 93 houses, Lenny D is named for its notion of the middle or the mediator, designed with and for a predominantly North African community living in an outer district of Rotterdam. It is a unique example of how a housing scheme in Northern Europe can take on a broad cultural heritage of an immigrant community. I want to find out if the integration of broader typologies and references has created dwellings that are better places for the residents to live. I'm an architect based in London, currently working for David Conn Architects, teaching with him at the Architectural Association and running a research studio with Nana Baima of Fusu Kostu Dunyali. My practice has been influenced by an awareness of broadening the architectural canon and documenting a variety of experiences in housing, especially from the African continent, not just from a Eurocentric perspective. Hassani Idrisi, a successful Moroccan entrepreneur living in Rotterdam, is the client behind the project. Alongside a social housing trust and the architects Gertz and Schultz, he developed an urban block that takes reference from a Moorish wall city, a new world of outdoor rooms between the housing blocks. Between the entrance gates, narrow streets lead to a more formal interior square and two planted courtyards. The house facades switch between decorative brick patterns and colorful tones. There is the potential for each house to incrementally grow with provision offered for the extensions above the garages. Some commenters have critiqued the development for its disnification or symbolic application of cultural references. The practice has since gone on to build further schemes for communities in Eindhoven and most recently for a Surinamese community in Amsterdam. I want to explore if an architecture can truly represent the identity of a minority community and through this, a new architecture can be formed. To find out more, I speak to co-founder of the practice, Jeroen Gerst, to discuss how the story of the project came to be, how it sits within the city 10 years on, and what it means for the future of housing in Northern Europe. Thank you, uh, Vesra. Um, I'm very um, proud I can speak with you uh, about these projects. Um, and maybe it's interesting a little of my background that I studied in Delft uh, um, all, um, under the architect Aldo van Eyck. He was one of my teachers and he introduced us as students to other cultures. So I think that's, that's an important um, starting point. And then later in my career, that was not this first project, but um, my second project um, was was a big housing project in the hague and because we were now we, we knew some people from the city in the hague uh, and then they gave us this project and this project was in an urban plan of the architect alvaro Siza. so he's my second master of, after aldo van eyck and uh, Cesar was uh, introduced in the Netherlands as a foreign architect uh, because they thought he maybe he could better feel what the new Dutch people uh, would like to to have as their their house how how their communities were built. So he he did some a project in Portugal before and after in Kreuzberg in Berlin. So with this experience, he was invited in the Netherlands and um, I could work with him. And uh, that was the first moment I saw a housing plans, which were uh, not only very practical for Dutch people, but also for foreign people, because there was a, a separation in the plan for the, the part for the men and for the women, but you could with sliding doors, you could change it. So, the, and also the position of the, the, the toilet was very uh, important. Uh, and in the end, these plans were, were made and it were uh, better plans in general. So he, he used this for better plans. He, he built 
uh, mock-ups of the plants with the inhabitants. Uh, so this was also practice in these days. And uh, I was very uh, lucky to also to do for Caesar the second project as a co-architect. Um, so that's, that were my lessons learned. Um, and I had contact with a friend who, who was an urban planner in the city of uh, Rotterdam. And this urban planner, he was um, uh, not married, but he had a, he had, had a, a girlfriend who was from a um, uh, Moroccan background. And he, he got in contact with, with uh, Moroccan people. And one was a, a businessman who had a, a a restaurant in Rotterdam, but he, he wanted to exchange his culture uh, with the, with Dutch people. And of course, the first uh, moment of exchange is that you eat each other's food. Uh, and uh, and so he started a restaurant and then he asked this urban planner if, if there was something possible on an urban scale. And this was the start of the project Le Midi. So uh, they first went to the, to the elderman and he said, no, we, we are not developers. So you have to go to a housing association. And this housing association uh, started a research group with uh, architects and uh, um, also um, other people. And I was not involved in this uh, period. So I followed the, this project because I was a friend of the planner, but uh, I was not involved. And with this group, they visited uh, cities in Morocco and in Turkey to uh, what to develop what they called a toolkit. So uh, the idea of the toolkit was to have uh, a kind of grip on the on the process to uh, test in the end if the if the design would uh, be really what they wanted in the beginning. And these points of the toolkit were points about the housing, housing typology, about the public space, um, about the architecture, um, uh, about some, uh, the architecture, about some ornament in the architecture. So this, this was a, a kind of mix of, of elements they found in, in the Mediterranean countries. They made uh, for a part of Rotterdam um, a plan which was based on these points. And I think there were more or less 10 points. But the, the city uh, said this is OK, the points are in it, but it, it's not a coherent ur urban scheme. And then uh, there was a, a, a selection started um, to find an urbanist, arch an architect, to uh, develop the project in the in the next phase, and I I won this selection with also telling about my background, uh, about about my affections with other cultures, um, also about my travels, and uh, I first made. Uh, a plan of the whole neighborhood, uh, an analysis of the whole neighborhood, and I uh, positioned this project in the neighborhood, which was very important to make it not a special project, but to integrate it in, in the neighborhood. That it was really a part of the, you can say, Dutch fabric. Now it's finished, it's, for me, it's, uh, I'm quite happy with it, but in the beginning, I was a little bit afraid to, to make a kind of kitsch project that you 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 uh, um, you use things from other cultures as a kind of pastiche on on uh, on the scheme, but we I think we um, managed to really integrate everything in also a, a Dutch housing typology, mm -hmm. and um, and all that time this uh, Moroccan uh, businessman uh, we used him to to uh, test if we were still on the right, in the right way, we were designing what he uh, 
had in mind in, at the beginning with this idea of this cul cultural exchange. And we had a lot of problems, of course, with every project there are, there are uh, things to overcome. Um, it was first started as a, as a project for rent by the housing association, but they decided that there should be more uh, owners, housing owners in the, that area because there was too much social housing. So um, the, these houses uh, were sold to people and we, we needed a more commercial um, developer. And this was also a building company who at halfway took over the project and used this idea uh, in a commercial way. So that was, it was, it started with the kind of idea of uh, uh, people, how they live together in, in, in a community and in houses. But for this building company, it was interesting be because they could um, make a, a very commercial project out of it. Mm -hmm. It attracted many people, not only people from the Mediterranean, but also Dutch couples or mixed couples. So it's a very mixed project. And this was the first, uh, that we were the first houses for sale in the area. So it was also to, to make a kind of um, step in the career of, of people living the, in the area itself to, to go from rent to, to, to uh, we could afford to, to buy a house. Um, but there were also people from far away who come, came to this project because they liked so much the atmosphere of the architecture. And it, it really now is a very strong community who, uh, which lives there. I also spoke with Katja Edens, an architectural historian and resident of Lemidi, who's lived there for 10 years with her husband and two daughters. So uh, once we knew we wanted to stay in the city, we started looking there. And of course, it's it's not easy to to find a place um, where your children can 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 play outside and can go at, outside by themselves. And that's what Le Midi offered. So that was very, very important to us. And then, um, you know, when we started looking at, at first, I thought maybe this feels a bit too much like a gated community but then when we went and 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 had a look at this area we found out that it was not like that at all it was you know the gates were always open it was you, you could move through it was not forbidden to go there and and you'd see people you know taking the shortest route somewhere through um the area which actually felt very communal um, uh, uh, but still being connected to the surroundings, not, not being completely, you know, like a, not being that compound. Uh, it's, it's a part of the city, so to speak, because there is like two streets and then there is this square in the middle, in the middle, and there's um, the borders of Le Medi are houses as well. So, so it's, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a castle or something. <laughs> I don't know the details of it, but I do know there was a bit more money available to realize, to, to, to build this uh, Le Midi than there would normally be. Something like the mosaic, for example, which is in one of the uh, gateways, which is uh, designed by a, an artist, quite a well-known artist actually. But also, for example, the fountain, which is in the middle. Um, and uh, the, 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 the scheme with all the green and the, and, the, and, the, and the trees in the middle. Those are things that you would normally, you would normally not have money for. And those are things that really make up for a lot of the quality, of course, because, um, you know, if you wouldn't have like a central square with places to sit or maybe um, like this fountain or um, it, it would feel completely different, you know. And it's also something, and maybe that's important too, I, I'm not sure, it's something you take care of as, um, as a community because we, we are, um, 
part of um, yeah we call that um, VVA. So it's it's actually the group of people that are owners of this of of the houses in Le Midi. and um, uh, we we organize taking care of this, you know, and sometimes it's more or less formal, like someone, you know, uh, uh, coming to take care of the of the trees or maybe uh, cutting uh, the hedges and so on. But sometimes like in summer, for example, it's, it's very informal. And, uh, you know, my neighbor just asked me, uh, are you willing to uh, take care of the plants um, uh, for a week in August? And then, you know, we have this garden hose, <laughs> That somebody bought, and 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 a key to a place where the, where the where the tap is, and and you just go there every every night, and 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 you you, you water the plants, you know, for for like an hour or so. So so um and and this is something you know it's sort of asked of you to take part in it, or I think it's 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 part of the fun maybe, uh, but it also. Um, uh, it also causes for people to have something uh, to do with each other, so to speak, or to have a connection or a joint responsibility. So many interesting points raised. I mean, um, I wondered if, and I, I still want to kind of ask you um, how you think sort of designing housing that responds to the residents' identities directly impacts um, their experience of the housing, but also um, how one designs. But then on a different tact, I wondered if we could have a conversation also about, um, and you've kind of touched on, on, a, on a, a lot, this idea of kind of contaminating authorship. So you and your practice working with many different stakeholders, but also different architects and um, different identities and um, uh, styles in your architecture and and what that means for you as a, an architect with your own practice how do you ratify the sort of uh, lack of control let's say on the authorship is that something you welcome in your practice and how you work or is it something you're always trying to fight against I sort of feel like within the younger generation right now in architecture this idea of authorship is sort of a bit old fashioned, let's say, and we really see the role of the architect as a mediator. So I wondered if you could speak a bit more directly, um, if that's conscious or not. Yeah, as an architect, you are not a painter. So as a, when you are, make a painting, it's, it's from you, it's you, you are the author. And I, I think and as an architect, you are also always part of a big chain of stakeholders and you are one of them, <laughs> uh, but you have, you have a very, central position in in as a designer to to integrate all the aspects which is money which is construction but also uh, identity of the project so it it's important to 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 keep this position in this in the center and not to be on the side and then you you, you should be a very good designer you should be you you have to know a lot about all kind of technical things and costs because money, especially in the, in the Netherlands and, and also in the UK is so important because when there is no money, you can't make the project. So money is a part of the design. Um, so that's also that we, in Le Midi, we decided to have one uh, bay of uh, every house has the same width, except from the, the, the corners. So it, it, that makes, it's a very rational project. And it's not because cultures are rational, but because we want, we, we could make affordable housing there. Okay, I think that's a really good moment to sort of talk yeah, about the construction methods and maybe some of the practicalities you mentioned using a sort of rational model, module, sorry, uh, for the housing. Um, but what about the kind of materiality? Uh, there was, a lot of comments made about the brick and how it relates to, of course, the, the Dutch culture and uh, the Dutch material culture, but you also use this sort of white colonnade, um, which uh, I think nods to Caesar's Malaguerra project, but also, of course, you know, Lemedy nods to kind of Shabam in 
Sana'a in Hadramut in Yemen. Um, so I feel like there was a real kind of balance of thought and materiality and how it links to both the Dutch culture and the Arab culture. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that. Yes, what, what I like the also the references you mentioned is that that it's uh, always a fusion. It's a mix of all kinds of influences. And you are not always aware of it when you are designing, but you it's all in your uh, in your head when you're, when you're doing it. But uh, the brick is the cheapest building material in, in uh, for in our country. Mm -hmm. uh, but we we try to to um, to use the brick in different ways. So in uh, on the outside we we try to get a, uh, to try to make a brick not to to use it not in a Dutch way, but to uh, in color and in the joints, joints it looks more like a um, North African uh, um, housing project. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the central space, for, um, for example, we we first thought we to make it a, a blue, the kind of blue square, but the developers say it's that's too strong. We, we don't think people like it. And then we painted it white, but in different colors white. So it's not one color white, but it's, it's very subtle each house. And then with the, the, the stone, um, uh, the stone around the, the windows, it, it looked, it, it reminded me on Portuguese churches. So it's, uh, which, so it, it's, um, for me, it's also, it was a, to, uh, for us. It was interesting because it made us free from the, the very strong modernist way of designing we learned at school. Although we had lessons from Van Eyck, there, there is a kind of idea in in the Netherlands that uh, architecture should be modernist, and that's the main the mainstream. And uh, we we in Holland, architects are afraid that people call them old fashioned. So you are not modern, you are old fashioned. Mm -hmm. And this kind of designing, we made us free from this uh, modernist tradition and to uh, look for other uh, influences, which is with this theme, we had more easy than in other projects we do. Yeah, I mean, I, th I really think the brilliance of this project is its relationship to context and how it's, um, you know, it's kind of, questioning in a way, okay, we're responding to context, but whose context, what context, and how do we respond to existing context, but still create contemporary context. And I feel like what you're saying is the contemporary context, you know, of the Netherlands now is this kind of layering of identities and cultures. So it is now reflected in your built environment. Um, do you feel like the projects you do since, since Lenny D and the Volta Galvani have continued this trajectory? We just uh, realized another project in Amsterdam, which maybe is not so known yet in, uh, in the UK, um, which is called Mi Oso. And um, this is in uh, the uh, southeast part of Amsterdam. And this is an area with a large community from uh, um, Suriname. Maybe you know this in South America, yeah, yeah. part of South America. There's a big Surinamese community in the Netherlands because yeah. it used to be a, a colony. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we started with the same developer as Le Midi. We, we started uh, the project in Amsterdam and uh, my idea was to do something with um, uh, this Suriname culture and my wife is from Suriname so uh, I had many contacts in, uh, contacts in this community mm -hmm. and now the project is after uh, we started in 2008 so it's now after 12 years it has been realized. And it's just at the moment this Black Lives Matter uh, movement comes up. And so there is a lot of 
there are a lot of interesting uh, um, reactions on, on our projects. Uh, the people who live there now, a lot of have a Suriname background, so they like the project very much. But there is also a discussion uh, about uh, what what is the can you use the colonial background in architecture? So, yeah. And I like this discussion because we need discussion to get further. I try to make the houses, the housing plans, uh, not too Dutch. Uh, for instance, to enter the house directly in the living room, which is in, quite common in Suriname. But here also the developer has a uh, an influence, and he said, "No, it's not what I want to sell. It's uh, it's not all people like it." Um, so I had to change the plans. Uh, so it's. The process is also part of um, of the pro of the project, yeah. and it's a, it's a contemporary process with different stakeholders. So I have my ideas, the builder has ideas, and in the end, it's also a kind of fusion between uh, theory and practice. But people who live there, they really like it. It it will be pub uh, publicated in the architectural yearbook. So this project which is from 11 years ago it's now in, in the, on the focus of uh, also of um, uh, architectural critics because um, I think the time has changed a lot the uh, last 10 years yeah feels like your practice has sort of been gravitating towards these kinds of projects like you you saw sort of, you sort of you know, seeking them out rather than they're just falling on your lap. Um, do you feel like that's a response to the context in the Netherlands or um, is that a fight? A fight to get projects like this? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, the most developers are, are not interested in this whole story. So only mm -hmm. when it's um, uh, interest, if it's commercial interest, they they are interested and housing associations, um, they um, have less influence. Um, they are more and more par uh, part of the, of the market. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we worked with Alvaro Siza, the housing associations were keen in, to experiment with also with uh, new plans for, for uh, for their apartments there was these apartments were also larger in size there were, there were more possibilities um, now after 30 years they just they buy a project from a, a product from a builder which is the most cheapest project they uh, can afford so um, it, it's difficult to 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 realize projects like this so you, it's also a reason we, do, we, we don't do this in every project every time. I suppose I guess the market would change if they saw the value it did bring to residences or like you said in Le Midi, how it's become so popular of a place to live. And I wondered if you could speak a bit more about that. You said you, you go back and talk to some of the inhabitants. Um, you know, what do the residents say? How do they feel about um, how the architecture kind of incorporates all these nods to their identity or something they're familiar with. They, they really, I think, they are really interested in the project also because it has a special thing in it. So although some people are at, have no, uh, at the Dutch background, they are really like not, not to live in uh, just an average project. Yeah. I spoke, uh, last year, a lot with the people from this Amsterdam project, from with Suriname people, and these people also. They were uh, there are houses for sale and houses for rent, and they all say we we are so happy with the project because it it just gives them an identity uh, of a place with, where they can um, have identity which they know, which they feel from their from the background of their families. And, and they like also very much the communal spaces that they, that's part of the project, it's not only uh, 
the identity of the architecture or the plans, but also there should be places where they can uh, come together and do things together. And um, in this Amsterdam project, we don't we don't have a square because it doesn't exist in Suriname, but we have a garden. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a garden with uh, also special plants, which reminds of the Suriname uh, plants and so on. Yeah, I mean, that's really a key factor in the research we're doing with Studio Nyali, you know, this, this aspect of the communal space and how communal space is so important to certain cultures, it's almost like integral to the way they live. So to be brought into housing that doesn't have that or that doesn't respond to that need feels very stark and unnatural and, you know, not comfortable, a place to live. So. That's a really important factor that you picked up on. You said there was um, a kind of ability to grow and to build more on the roofscapes. Um, I wondered if you, you know, is there this element of informality that has grown from the project? People kind of added their own, their own individual uh, layer to the project. Yes, but we were, we were, we did before we. Um... To, get, to, to keep the unity more or less, we had some building elements they could uh, add to their houses. So an, an extra floor or uh, to make a deep, to build their houses, make a deeper house on the terraces they, they had. And um, that what they add in the street is that we had a zone before the house, which they could, um, um, how do you call it in English? Um, absorbed, so they, they could place elements on it, uh, like uh, a bench or uh, some plants, to to make a kind of private space before their houses. And you you see that uh, to identify them with their house, they put elements before the house they like. Mm -hmm. So that's also. Uh, a way in Holland we we use this. Uh, we call it the the stoop from Delft, so this uh, the pavement is a pavement uh, area before the house of maybe one or two meters and there you see also you see it in the, in the British uh, muse is in these areas yeah. so people have some uh, area before the house to put personal elements in it and in uh, the Amsterdam project we had a veranda so it's a covered space um, and there they, they, they have these elements you see in the Caribbean. Uh, so they are uh, private, it's, it's, a, it's a, a place between private and public. It's semi-private, semi-public. Uh, there is also a, a book in, uh, in the Netherlands about Hofjes, about the culture of, of Hofjes. Hofjes is small courts, uh, Hofje. And in this book are also a few examples of uh, modern Hofjes, modern, and Le Midi is one of the projects in the book. Uh, yeah. And the idea, which is very special here, is that this Hof is a, not a public place, so but it's common, a common area. So it's owned by the inhabitants. So also the, the square space is owned by the inhabitants, and that's very important is uh, because it's a private area and not a public area and mm -hmm. there was a lot of discussion about this because um, people called it a gated community mm -hmm. because also there are there are gates yeah but we we thought the gate as something which was positive that people themselves could regulate um, uh, their own a living area so but there was a, a agreement with the city that they should open the gates between eight in the morning and eight at night and then close them during the night and they asked them if if the people asked the community if it, if it was allowed to to close the gates on sunday so normally it was for religions it was the day of rest but uh, in the beginning there were a lot of architectural tourists coming to see the project and they want one day of rest so they 
uh, now close the close the gates at Sunday. I think that's fair enough. <laughs> It has more to do, I guess, with uh, dimensions, maybe, and also with also with that communal sense of having, you know, like a piece of the sidewalk which be sort of belongs to your house, where you put your pots and your plants and your and your and your and maybe a little bench to sit on or to sit on, or you put your 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 bicycles, maybe you park them in front and stuff like that, and so and 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 and. So this feels like an in-between space, which is ours, but not entirely, which is ours as, which is owned by the people uh, that live in Le Medi. Um, but, you know, everybody can walk through that if they like. And then there is outside of the gate, I would perhaps, you know, when I park my bicycle, I would put it on two locks always you know one lock just a normal lock and the other lock i sort of lock it to a pole or a lamppost or something and then when i go inside and it's in front of my house i just put the one lock so that's sort of the difference in 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 feeling i guess maybe you know it's not your fight to fight but if you could uh maybe speak a little bit about how you think this could relate to London, the London context, why you think that we're not designing housing like this in London, or if you think we are. I know there, there was a project by Sergis and Bates, not built, but trying to do similar things. And I'm sure there's other projects that have tried to integrate, but have not even come close to the kind of success of Lenny D or the Walter Galvani. Um, so yeah, if you have any advice. Uh so don't um, directly uh, uh, transfer uh, the, the ways people like to live with each other to to political issues. For you, you get you are against foreign people, or right. uh, so that uh, I think because we always um, stated that it's it's not to make houses for special people only, but just to to exchange cultures, so we are interested in other cultures. We we, we go abroad uh, to all to, on our holidays, and um, we like to to eat our food. And why not to to share cultures? We can enrich our culture, like we architect architecture has always enriched itself with different cultures. So, um, so don't make. Uh, it's a political issue, I think. Uh, try to get contact with with the people who are really um, uh, the new inhabitants. Don't think only for the people, but, but let let them speak themselves. So that's maybe also important. Uh, yeah, and try to find uh, an investor who is interested, all, not only to do something with other cultures, but also who can use it uh, as a selling point. Mm -hmm. Because what we discovered is that cultures have a lot in, have a lot in common. So we all like uh, a hofje. It's not a thing uh, which is only come from Ghana or something of, uh, from a compound. They are very contemporary because hofjes are without cars, are um, safe for children so uh, and you come in in um, things which are uh, yeah, interested for all people which are maybe uh, basic architectural themes we, we you can use um, and try to uh, enrich your architecture with uh, not only uh, stay in modernist thoughts but look at maybe really British things more, more. So also look at your own culture. And of course, it's already so layered with, you know, um, people from various places being in this country for such a long time. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so um, I feel like our relationship to um, a sort of diverse range of cultures has been going for a long time. And 
it's almost like we haven't really stopped and dealt with it, you know, in the same way that we have, uh, perhaps the Dutch have. You have you had so many more colonies than we had, so exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I wondered if I could read out a quote, and this was written by Joseph Henry. It's it was written for the award I presented at the Sound Advice Awards. And it goes like this, we need to talk about material culture, especially when we represent cultures in these United Kingdom. When our families arrived here with one suitcase and very few possessions into a very established built environment. Yes, we added our swagger to our adopted community, the smells of our cooking, the sounds of our music, occupying space by making ourselves visible. But when we realize that Henry Tate stands proud on Windrush Square, we have to question how much of the built environment continues to reinforce the heaviness of our past. How can we start to build our own material culture, a culture that can exert and make visible our enduring existence in the city and that questions what has become the default for quality in the architectural canon, when it could be argued that we are taught to like, that what we are taught to like is just the taste of the dominant. I wondered what you thought of that and the kind of move for, yeah, these other cultures to exert their own identities as well as integrate. Yes, architecture is of course a very slow, uh, slow thing. So yeah. you, you are always behind uh, what uh, behind uh, the things which are hap happening now. The project of ten years ago can can be. Of a different was was realized in a different period as so we, where we live now. So you always have to transform uh, what is there. Also, which is maybe the uh, mainstream of the uh, of the community. You can transform everything. So you can transform streets in, into into squares you can uh, to, to just to keep out of the cars people will will live together then in in a street which was before for cars so it's a completely different way of living together so, so i think there is enough you you can use of also of the material of the and you can also add ornaments you can add uh, things to the architecture and sometimes you have to put in new things so i think try to to uh, to integrate and to fuse with each other, and make projects which are not have not uh, which are not really uh, sufficient for only one group of people. I think it goes back to and what you're trying to say is this kind of idea of creating a contemporary context. So the contemporary context is not just them and us, but it is a sort of uh, integration of the different cultures and different identities and it's not singular as you say it's a very pluralistic context that we live in today so and, it, and it's it moves all the time exactly so if we want to evolve with the times we need to sort of um be more open to uh bringing in changes um and less uh fixated on carrying through like a certain idea of a culture but also it, it brings elements in which which we can use mm. so it, it makes yeah for me it makes our lives richer for watching the first episode of AF Turns 30, a new weekly series looking back at the people, projects and policy that have shaped the architectural landscape over the past 30 years. Tune in next Thursday when David Ogamiwa will be talking to David Adjay, Stephen Taylor and Steph McDonald and Tom Emerson of 6A about their respective projects on Chance Street. If you'd like to find out more, head to architecturefoundation.org.uk.